This video is going to look at battle formation, how it's flown by Royal Air Force and Royal Navy fighter pilots, the British way. We'll also take a look at some tactical turns and learn some of the basics. The first thing we're going to look at is battle formation. Battle formation you'll find referenced in the DCS manuals, mostly as combat spread, that's what the Americans call it. We call it battle formation. Essentially, you're flying line abreast to give each other a cross cover in a visual sense. In this instance, the leader is on the left and the wingman is on the right, flying more or less a constant distance apart. You'll see some of the factors later that will vary that distance. The aim is to cover your assigned arcs. Generally speaking, you spend most of your time looking in the green arcs. You do look around everywhere, but the green arcs are what you want to be looking at because the red arc there is your most vulnerable arc, and so you certainly need to be checking that too. And Wingman does exactly the same, and thus we have mutual cross cover throughout the mission. The view from the cockpit. Most of the time you need to be spending looking at your oppo, checking his 6 o'clock. Take the odd look out the front and all around the other sectors, just to make sure you're not going to go and crash into a mountain or something stupid like that. In this particular example, as we look to our right, you will see that the wingman is ever so slightly forward of where he should be. So he's obviously flying a slightly different speed. There are ways to correct it, and we'll look at those later. The distance between aircraft depends on a number of factors. Aircraft size, the weather, the terrain, and whether we're ingressing or regressing to and from the target. We'll look at tactics in a different video and how that affects. In order to maintain our position in the formation and maintain that mutual cross cover while navigating at low level or indeed at medium level, we employ a series of conventions and a series of techniques to allow us to keep the battle formation during turns. In this instance we have a route as you can see here and our pilots have made a 90 degree right turn because that's what the route requires. Notice we're not quite on the route, it doesn't matter. The only two points that you need to be on the route are your IP and your target. Notice as well that we do not call these turns. Every wingman is a thinking wingman, unlike you might find in other air forces, you leave the conversion units and the training units trained up to be a leader as well as a wingman. You anticipate the turns, there should be no radio calls on tactical turns at low level on a planned route, unless the turn isn't being made where it's supposed to be made, or if you have to make a change due to weather or any other extraneous factor. Whilst engaged in flying your tactical route, maintaining your tactical formation, You'll refer to your track as track 12 and track 6. Nobody needs to refer to the heading or do any complicated maths. The waypoint is ahead of you, you're flying in a battle pair. Straight ahead is track 12, behind you is track 6. To the right is track 3, to the left is track 9. This becomes important when we look at evasion techniques and we want to maintain formation integrity. In this instance, we're going to try and maintain formation integrity because we have to avoid some weather. The big red splodge you see on the track straight ahead of us at track 12. We could do an in-place turn which would take us out of battle position as we see here. Alternatively, we could use what we call a double assisted turn which will maintain the battle integrity. In this instance, the formation leader is calling a 30 star but it should come as no surprise to the wingman. It's a double assisted turn, you'll find the details in the SOP document. I will also do another video later to show you how a double assisted turn works. But you notice we maintain the formation integrity We'll now take a look at some of the basic manoeuvres to maintain the battle formation. In this instance, the formation that we're flying is called Chivana Battle. It's an old school British method. And you'll notice there's a third person here. He's latched onto the leader's wing on the right hand aircraft. This is the rotate. Number two avoids. He's now just turning into the southerly man. This is essential on a rotate and a shackle and a turnabout the number two must avoid, high or behind or both. You make these turns at between 3 and 4G. In the rotate, one method of adapting the geometry of the turn is for both of you to turn slightly inwards afterwards to regain the ideal battle formation before rolling out on track six. The next maneuver we're going to look at is the shackle. The shackle is a method of swapping sides. Before we look at the shackle though, we're just going to talk a little bit about the Chivana battle I did briefly described. The reason we have it in this instance, we have a third man on this formation. It's a way of keeping him within the formation. There are other methods and then we'll go on to those in advanced formations later.
Turn towards each other, 45 degree angle, number two avoids, reverse, look over your shoulder, back into battle. That's a couple of the basics, now let's look at the simplest of all the turns, the 90. In this case, a 90 port. The outside man initiates the turn, and this time the convention is different. The outside man avoids, regardless of whether he's number one or number two in the formation. And you can see after the 90 degree turn, there we are back in battle. We'll take a quick introduction now into double assisted turns, in this case the 30 that we've already seen before. These are called double assisted turns. There was no assistance in a 90, we just did a 90 degree turn, a delayed turn. The double assisted turn means that both aircraft will assist the turn. The turn is going to be to the right. The outside man is the southerly man as we see at this point because we're going to the right. His responsibility is avoidance, regardless of whether he's the formation leader or the number two, he will avoid. He will turn towards the right and overturn past the 30 degree mark. The inside man will turn towards by approximately 25 to 30 degrees. They'll look over their shoulder, engineer a 90 crossover and reverse their turn. As a result, they'll roll out in battle. Let's now look at some concepts for targets. Generally speaking you will have planned the target, you'll have your target and your IP. These are the two waypoints that you must achieve. Various options are open to you. In battle formation you might just draw one IP to target which is the simplest because it's only two sets of waypoints and the number two will just essentially fly in battle. Pitch in afterwards and follow the same trail through the target. A common error is not to plan or brief how you're going to depart from the target and maintain formation integrity. In this instance, the leader has gone hard right and reversed, whilst the number two has gone through the target and continues straight ahead. That leaves us in battle. A disadvantage is turning immediately after a target shows a plan form aircraft to every enemy gunner missile operator. There are alternatives and each has its own advantages and disadvantages in a tactical scenario but essentially it must be planned and briefed to maintain formation integrity such that we minimize radio transmissions. Other methods of planning can give us a different option. We can plan an individual IP for each aircraft in the formation. In this instance, you see a separate IP for the number two aircraft, and you also see a separate final attack track based on the target. And we've also planned our egress much in a similar way we had done previously. The further alternative is an entirely set of different waypoints for the number two going into the target. The reason we would use something like this is mainly to get extra track miles before running into the target. And this is a requirement because of the blast envelope if we have the same DMPI, desired mean point of impact of the weapon. Large, retarded, high explosive bombs will often require approximately 40 seconds between aircraft to give enough of a safety margin. This isn't necessarily a specific blast requirement, it's for the debris, the pieces, the chunks and the shrapnel to be falling down from the sky, we don't want that hitting our windman. The alternative to avoid having to put timing dog legs in is to fly completely different DMPIs that stay outside the blast radius and fragmentation expected radius. This is a simple plan but again requires separate waypoint inputs for the leader and the number two. So what's the secret of maintaining good battle turns and getting good at it? It's practice, practice, practice.
even when you screw up the turn there's always a way of getting back into battle an in place turn will remove any displacement and then you can go from there The secret is to fly an accurate speed and an accurate heading, or at least towards the waypoint in general terms. Don't get too bunched about single degrees. It's the 420 knots or the 480 knots on targets or whatever you're using or briefing that you use. We do this with a minimum of radio chat, not like some other air forces do. The wingman should be a thinking wingman. He should always be thinking what happens next, what's required of me, what is the leader want me to do. But leaders, don't over control your wingman. Let him think about it for himself. If he gets it wrong, drag him back, but let him start the turn. Let him think about it for himself. Let him organize his own cockpit. In this That's it for now. Future videos will expand on some more advanced techniques, but keep practicing until then. I need to be.